to be in James chapter 1. Let's go ahead and read. I, goodness, you gave me like no time to teach. Um, James chapter 1, we've been verses 12 through 22 this morning. I'm going to go ahead and read and then we'll pray. It says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to worship you. Lord, to take communion, to partake in your suffering, your death, but also your resurrection. Lord, the joy that comes from that. Father, I pray that you speak to us through your word, that your Holy Spirit would be present in this room, in us. Lord, guiding us into all truth, giving us understanding to what you have for us this morning. And Lord, we thank you for the young people. We thank you for the teens, the preteens, Lord, even the children. Lord, what you're doing in this church, what you're doing out in the homes, in the community, and what you're doing especially in every individual. And so I pray that you would just continue to bless us. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, and we just thank you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So James starts off kind of sounding like um, Jesus a little bit in the, in the Beatitudes where he says, blessed be, right? Blessed is the man who endures temptation. And blessing here speaks of a, of a happiness but what I really need to do and what we really need to do is define what temptation is here as James is speaking on this in this chapter here because it's, it's littered throughout. And so there's really two viewpoints of temptation in this scripture. Um, there's two ways to look at it, two senses, I would say. The first one is temptation, which is causing you to sin. It's a solicitation to sin. And as we study through this, we're going to find out that that type of temptation does not come from God, and we'll explain why, but it comes from the enemy, okay? That's Satan's efforts. That's what it falls into that category. The second temptation, it's viewed from God's point of view, which is oftentimes defined as like a test, right? To prove yourself righteous, not self-righteous, but to prove that you are righteous, right? To prove that you have been faithful, you are faithful, right? And we know that God doesn't tempt us beyond what we're able, right? He, he provides what we need when it comes to this testing. So he never does it, in essence, to cause us to fail, right? He knows that we can be found approved and to prove that righteousness. And so again, the temptation can either be referring to a difficult time, like trying to cause you to sin or a trial, but there's also um, the temptation from God, which again is a test, in James chapter 1, verse 3, which we didn't get to read or go through, but James says this. He says, actually in verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And so this word, the Greek, and for trials, it means to put someone to the test, right? To uh, find the purpose or discover the purpose of that person's nature or that thing's quality. And so that's what God is doing. Again, God doesn't send us evil things that cause us to sin. That's not in his nature, but rather he tests us again. And he says in verse two, and that's why we can count it all joy, right? Because it comes from God and God is a good God. So again, the word blessed here means happy. The word endure here means to remain under or to persevere. And what I love about scripture is that it's very clear that we as Christians are not like wimpy, weak people, right? I think that's how the world kind of sees us. But all throughout scripture, it talks about us being, uh, you know, servants, warriors, standing, fighting, um, you know, persevering, enduring. You know, we, we are strong people. And it's not because it's anything of our own flesh and our own doing, but we have the power of Christ in us. So we're not called to be weak, right? We're to fight the good fight. And so he says, James says, blessed, 
is the man who endures this temptation, who perseveres, who does not quit, right? Christians should not be quitters. We're to endure through trials and to hold fast to our faith in Jesus Christ. And why is that? Well, James gives us the answer here. He says, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. That's what I want. That's what you should desire, the crown of life. Well, what is that? Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 speaks of it, where Jesus is teaching and, and sharing and writing to the church in Smyrna. And he speaks about trials. You see it in the very first part of this verse. He says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Right? So you can, you can prove yourself. And you will have tribulation 10 days, but be faithful until death. We're to persevere. We're to endure. Why? And I will give you the crown of life. This crown of life is eternal life found in Christ Jesus. Now, the Christian life, it's all about how you start, which is found in our faith in Jesus Christ, which we receive the free gift of salvation, right? But it's also vital and so important how we finish. We must finish, and we must finish well. And again, the point here is not that James is saying that we, you know, we have to stop sinning to gain eternal life. That's not the point. Jesus has done the work. He has redeemed us on the cross, and we've put our faith in him. But you will be proven that you have been faithful to Christ, that you believe in Christ by standing and enduring until the end. So we fight this battle. We endure. We don't quit against sin. And as Paul says in Ephesians, we, we're called to stand. In the very end, all you're called to do is to stand. Right? I think oftentimes we think of ourselves as like, you know, we're, all, we're fighting the devil, and what we fail to realize is that God's already victorious, right? He's already beat the devil, like, pretty good. He's been defeated. He's done, right? And we, we fight from a stance of victory, and, and it's not even a fighting, because oftentimes, you know, you hear people saying, you know, I'm going to put the devil in a headlock and curb stomp him and punch him, and I'm, I'm like, no, like, that's, I'm not dealing with him. Like, even Michael the Archangel, you see in Jude, had, had, a, had a somewhat of a respect for, for Satan, and he said, the Lord rebuke you. I mean, this is an angel. This is Michael. And how much more should I be the same way? Like, I'm not, it's not me of my own accord fighting against Satan. No, I'm called to stand. And so Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, he says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. To stand. There's a battle and Christ calls us to stand. And one of the ways that we can stand and combat this is by taking up the whole armor of God. But here's the thing, guys. Don't we fall sometimes? Yes. We do. Does that disqualify us? No. It doesn't. Psalm, uh, Solomon says in Proverbs 24, 16, he says, for a righteous man may fall seven times, but what happens? He rises again. But what do the wicked do? They shall fall by calamity. They stay down, right? Just, just because you've fallen down doesn't mean you've been disqualified. You're disqualified when you stay down and you don't get back up. It's kind of like boxing, right? You get knocked down, you're not out. It's only a matter of if you don't get back up. And thankfully, as Christians, we have more than 10 seconds to get back up, right? <laughs> and the thing is, too, we got to find out that it's not a matter of me getting myself back up. It's me turning to the Lord and him picking me up, right? And that's why the righteous is able to get back up. And I love that. So again, it's not a matter of about perfection, but perseverance is, is, again, it's not perfection, but it's enduring. And when we persevere under trials, you know, we can't really control what we face, but we really can, what we can control is how we respond to them. And so we're to persevere, as James says. Again, blessed is a man who endures temptation. Persevere, don't give up. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. Bear with me, I have a million reference verses. The Bible will explain itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. If you give up, you won't receive the prize, is what Paul says. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. I'm going to read a different version. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. I'm waiting for them. But I discipline my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. 
So in Christianity, again, it's not just about how you start, but it's also about how you finish, and we must finish well. Again, perseverance, it does not mean perfection. Nobody's perfect, but remember, righteous person who falls seven times rises again. You know, we get this a perfect example when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. You guys remember that story? And, you know, the, the main thing that hits us always is, like, Jesus is a servant. He's teaching them how to be a servant. But there was a deeper implication and meaning to what he was doing. So as he's going around, he's washing the disciples' feet. Peter says, don't wash my feet. And because he had a respect for Jesus, like, how dare you get on your hands and knees? Like, I should be doing that to you, right? And then Jesus responds and says, if I don't do this, I have no part with you. And then Peter's like, oh, goodness, I don't want to go that extreme. Like, wash my entire body. You remember this? And Jesus is like, no, 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 like, you've already been cleansed. And what Jesus is signifying is that at salvation, it's a one-time thing, guys. Like, you cannot lose your salvation. Jesus redeems us, and he washes us clean because of his precious blood that was spilt, right? But from that point on, what we understand is that we still battle against the flesh. James is going to be very clear on this. And so with that, we understand that we still fall. But we rise again. How do we rise again? Well, Jesus cleans our feet. What does that mean? That means if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Right? Because that sin, after I'm born again, it doesn't separate me from eternity from Christ, but it will separate me in my intimacy with Christ. And so that's why, you know, goodness, if it's not on a daily basis, I'm, I'm repenting the Lord because I've, I've done something. There's something in my heart. But I, you, we grow from it. We persevere. We stand. And so he goes on, and James says in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. We cannot, James is very clear, blame God. We cannot blame him for temptation when we fall into sin and be like, Lord, that, that's your doing. Because ultimately, if God was the one who sent that type of temptation to truly cause us to fail, to cause us to sin, there's no way out of it, right? I mean, who can stand up against God? No one. So we find out, as James is going to explain, that that type of temptation to cause you to sin is not from God. It's not of his nature. He's only good. Again, he's not the author of evil, so he never tempts anyone. But we know from our flesh, we know from the world, we know from Satan is where these things come from. But we got to be mindful that we're not blaming God. That was the very first thing that happened after the very first sin. You guys remember that? Adam and Eve, Eve sin. And then Adam says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 12, who does he blame? No, we think he blames Eve, but read it. It says, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree and I ate. He blamed God. And we got to understand, we're not the victims, right? We're the transgressors. And so who are we to blame God? And we can't. James is very clear on this. Again, because he's good in his nature. It wasn't of him. And so Adam's blaming God. But again, there's three things that that can be responsible for our temptation. The, The devil, the world, and me. Yourself. It's the biggest one. But we never want to own up to it. And James is like, you need to own up to it. That's how we grow. That's how we receive the crown of life. But one thing that we see that Satan does, like he did in Genesis 3, right before Adam blamed God, is Satan attacked God's word. But he did it through deception. Right? He attacked the foundation of truth. And so he says to Eve, did God really say? Right? Did he really say that? And so Satan will give us temptations to cause us to fall, but God gives us tests to make us stand. And again, these temptations to do evil or to sin, the solicitation to sin, it doesn't originate from God, right? But what he does do is that he does give us everything we need to overcome it. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And I know in your own life, you can speak just from experience that you've always had a way out. You've always had a way out, but we've just given into it. And again, as we know, there's this battle between the flesh and the spirit. I mean, Paul's pretty clear in it, right? He says, I do the things I don't want to do, and I do the thing, no, I don't do the things I do want to do, right? I mean, doesn't everyone relate to that verse? You're like, oh my goodness, Paul, you said that so well. But there's this battle constantly for the flesh. 
And I think for the flesh and the spirit, but sometimes like we give no provision for the spirit because we're always satisfying the flesh. We're always feeding the flesh. I mean, and we'll talk about this in a little bit of how we can really combat that. But God has not only given us what we need to overcome it, but the great thing about our God is that he actually relates to it. He understands it, right? We know we saw, you know, in his life that he was tempted, but he never fell into that temptation. He never sinned. He was found perfect and righteous. We see the temptation in the wilderness where the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness and then Satan met him there and tempted him, right? 40 days, didn't eat. He's like, hey, you want some bread? You and I would quickly be like, yeah, that's, (laughs) you don't even have to ask me, right? But he fought that as a man because what did he say? Because as, a, as a God, what could Jesus have done? We could have just completely annihilated Satan, right? But as man, teaching us, he says, no, it is written, right? The scriptures have power. They're not just words on a paper. They're powerful. When God created everything, how did he do it? Did he snap his fingers? He spoke it because his words have power. And so we too have to do the same thing. We too have to do the same thing. And so one of the things that I like about Philippians chapter 4, where Paul gives us kind of some insight in how to really nip it in the bud and stop it at the very beginning, this temptation, the, the allure of temptation, is to focus on our hearts and our minds. And so he says in verse 4 through 9, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. I think that's the first step. Just rejoice. But rejoice in the Lord. Let your gentleness be, be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And here's the key. He says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Because where does it really always start? It starts in the mind, right? And then it, it develops into the heart, and then it develops into to action. But we can cut it off if we do these things that Paul is encouraging us to do. And then he says in verses 8 and 9, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Do we do that? Do we encourage our kids to do that? Do we just let them listen to whatever music and watch whatever show and hang out with whatever type of people? And do we not obviously realize that it it influences us? I think we know that. And so we, even as adults, even though we have, you know, more freedom than kids per se, and we can do whatever we want, Right? Paul says, you know, um, not all things are, are lawful to me, but, no, what does he say? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. Right? So I might have the grace and the freedom to do these things, but is it really beneficial? Am I, am I, am I actually doing, should I do the opposite where I'm actually thinking about, okay, what are, what's pure? What's lovely? What's good? What's of good virtue and praiseworthy? He said, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. I mean, we have to be mindful of what we feed, right? Am I feeding the flesh or am I, am I feeding the spirit? And James goes on to say in verse 14, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And temptation comes from us, from our own flesh, from what we desire, from what entices us. And the interesting thing about that is it's all different for us. I mean, we all fall in the same categories, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But the enticement and the desire, it's different for every person. Some of us struggle with gluttony. Some of us, laziness. Some of us, sexual immorality. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You know what it is. And you know what it is because the word reveals it to you and the Holy Spirit convicts you of it. But what do we do with it? Do we just hide it? Do we just keep moving forward? But we're not going to grow if we don't repent of it, if God doesn't deal with it. And so we know that temptation comes from our own flesh. It does not come from God And God can't be tempted. Well, why? Because, again, he's not evil. He's good. He's the only one that is good. And so in verse 15, James goes and says, Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. This word here, it's it's very uh, illustrative of of pregnancy. Right? You've got the conception. You've got the growing. You've got the, the birthing. I mean, this is what the, James is giving us an idea of how this works, right? When desire has conceived, and this desire is this craving or this longing for what is forbidden or even maybe in the wrong context, right? Because sometimes not all desires are bad, but if we use that good desire in the wrong context, in the way that God has designed things, then it can become 
bad. And so James says it brings forth, again, uh, speaking of um, giving birth to or to produce. So here what happens is once you give the, the, the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin brings forth death, which we know is separation from God, and that's not our desire as Christians. Right? Now, I do believe that we cannot lose our salvation, but again, we can lose our intimacy. And if we're not left standing in the end, then I think it really shows what, what, what happened in the beginning. Right? That I really wasn't standing in the beginning. The end will really reveal what happened in the beginning. Was I really born again? Did God really save me? And if God has saved me, if he's redeemed me, yeah, I'm going to fall, but I'm going to get back up. And then I'm going to be found standing in the end, as Paul says. So a couple lessons from this is we know that temptation in and of itself isn't wrong because Jesus himself was tempted, but he did not fall into it. We recognize the root of it, right? That it comes from my own lust. It comes from my own flesh. I mean, Paul says this in Romans 7, 18. He says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. I do not find. Galatians 6, 7, as Paul continues, he says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever man sows, that he will also reap. Again, what are we, what are we sowing? What are we feeding? Right? What am, what am I putting in? Because what I put in oftentimes comes out. And Paul writes in Galatians 5.16, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And I love that verse because the opposite is not true. And the opposite is not the answer. And oftentimes we try to do things in our own, own flesh, in our own power. And the Lord of hosts is like, not by your might, not by your power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Right? And so what we find out is like, if you want to walk in the spirit, it's not a matter of not sinning. Right? Because I think we struggle with that. Maybe even at a young age, it's like, I got to stop sinning so that I'm closer to the Lord. Well, no, no, no. You draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. You walk in the spirit and the consequences of that is that you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because if you try to do it in your own power and your own strength, you, you're going to fall and you're going to fall hard. But the thing is that I love is that when we do fall, we can get back up because God is faithful. God doesn't give up. I'm so thankful for that. If we repent, right? 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we sin, it's not a matter of running away from God and hiding from him. We shouldn't be like Adam and Eve, right? We run to him because he's a good father. He, he wants to cleanse us. He wants to forgive us. I mean, we see the love that he has for us that he sent his only son to die for us, right? If he didn't care about us, he wouldn't have done that. But obviously he cares and so God is never responsible for evil, never responsible for sin. Because of his very nature, it's impossible for him to sin. It's impossible for him to be bad or evil, right? The only thing that God does with sin is he punishes it. And he does it righteously. And so here we're going to see in verse 16, as James says, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. And we see this often throughout scripture. We just quoted it in one of the reference verses. Don't be deceived. Well, why? Because Satan's deceptive, right? Does Satan have power? Yeah, but it's limited. Is it more powerful than, than what we have? No, because John says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So there has to be a, a little bit of respect for Satan, right? Like Michael did. But Satan cannot overpower us. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God. He's already victorious, right? When Jesus said it's finished and he rose again, it was done. But he's deceptive. And because he knows he can't overpower us, he tricks us. He's got wiles. He's got shenanigans. But we are not to be ignorant of his devices, right? We're to be aware. We're to know in what truth is so that when there's deception, it's very clear. When something's a lie, it's very, very clear to us. And that's what happened in the very beginning when they sinned, right? When, when uh, the serpent came to Eve, and again, he said, did God really say? But what he was tempting her with was, hey, God doesn't want you to eat this because if you eat of it, you're going to become like him. And he doesn't want that. He doesn't want you to be equals. He doesn't want you to, to be like him. He's selfish. He's prideful. And so he, he deceived her and fell into deception. And she didn't trust in God's word and understanding that it had power to it. Matthew 22, verse 29, I love it because 
here Jesus speaks to the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, all the religious people who knew the word but didn't know the word. They were deceived. They were mistaken. They challenged Jesus about the resurrection. They said, hey, what about the lady that marries, you know, the seven brothers? Which one's going to be her husband when they get to heaven? Which implies that there is no heaven. There is no resurrection. And Jesus said, you guys, you're dumb. (laughs) He says it nicer. He says, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. How amazing is that? That both go hand in hand, right? There's power in his words. We, We have to have scripture Right? We need that, but we also need to know the power of God, the Holy Spirit. We see in Acts chapter 1, the dunamis power that comes upon the church through the Holy Spirit. We can't have one without the other. And oftentimes we see this with a lot of people, a lot of different churches, that they're all about the word of God, but no spirit. And then there's other churches where they're all about the spirit of God, but no word. And we need both. And we have both. And we have both. We won't be deceived. We can fight. We can stand. But again, here's this warning of not being deceived. And I think oftentimes, as we go through trials, as we go through these temptations, you know, it's when we're, we become most vulnerable in that time. And I think that's when Satan kind of comes at us, where the flesh builds itself up. So we have to be aware that we're vulnerable to deception at that point. But again, what does Paul say in Ephesians six eleven? He says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that you can stand against the wiles of the devil, the deception, the trickery, right? He's smart. He's powerful, but he's not that powerful. He can't overpower us. You see the great example in the Old Testament when the magicians tried to emulate what what Moses did, right, in Egypt. And you remember what they did? Moses turned water into blood. You guys remember that? Like all of it. And then you know what the magicians did? And they had power. What did they do? They took whatever other clean water they had and they turned it into more blood. I'm like, how stupid are you? (laughs) Why wouldn't you have just turned the blood back into water? They couldn't. They could only imitate it a little bit. That's the power that Satan has. He has it and it's limited. But again, what does he have? He has these deceptions, right? And so Paul tells us, okay, when this comes, you know, before it comes, be aware, be ready right? Put on the whole armor of God. And what is so lacking and what's so sad is that as Christians, we have so many spiritual streakers that they only have the helmet of salvation. And that's not good enough. (laughs) It's not good enough. Yet, God saves, God redeems, and he makes us into a new creation. But that's just the beginning. That's just the first thing that comes on. And there's so much more. And then he tells us, look, there's the belt of truth which holds everything together. The truth is what recognizes the deception. David says in Psalm chapter 119, you guys know that's a very long chapter. It's in the middle of the Bible. It's all about the word of God. Go read it in your own time, but it'll take you 15 minutes. (laughs) David says in uh, verses 9 through 11, he says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Do we do that? Do we hide the word of God in our heart? Like, do do we know scripture? Do we know the promises of God and what he can do for us? In verse 17, James says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So again, we can't blame God because he's not evil. So any, any evil or wickedness that we face or any temptation to solicit us to sin is not from God because it's not his nature. But the opposite is true. All the good things we receive comes from God because he is good. It's his nature. He's good. You guys remember the, 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 the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, hey, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus is like, why do you call me good? He says, no one is good but one, that is God. And he's like, yeah, that's me. I'm good. I'm God. And Jesus is like, you're right. But there's only one because that's his nature. He's good. So this verse here really ties back to verses two and four, two through four with the idea that trials are one of God's perfect gifts because when we persevere in them, it produces spiritual maturity in us. We grow. But this, this title that is given by James is the only one we see in the entirety of the, the Bible is he calls him the father of lights. Well, what does that mean? I mean, think of like natural lights. We have the heavenly bodies. We have um, the sun, you know, things that uh, 
that are good, that represent goodness. Right? All throughout scripture, light is a representation of goodness. Darkness is a representation of bad. Right? You see that in Star Wars too. It's obvious. We get it. It's very, very clear. <laughs> so God's not the author of darkness is what James is saying. And 1 John tells us in uh, chapter 1, verse 5, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Right? In him there is no darkness at all. Same with the sun. It's always shining. But how do we know God is good? And look at this. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 45, Jesus says, You have heard, it, heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. That's a good God. He, he sends good to people who don't deserve it, which I think would include pretty much all of us, right? He's so gracious. But then James throws this in here. I love this. He says, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. What does that mean? Well, if he's the father of lights, like the sun, right, and he doesn't vary from his essential nature, which is light, which is goodness, right, this means that he is always good. There is no variation or shadow of turning, which means even at night, we understand this, that the sun is still shining, right? You just may not see it. It's like us going through a trial. Does that mean God stopped being good? No, it's of his very nature. So even with all the darkness and the evil that's around us, that we see, that we face, God is still good, is what James is saying. Well, what does that do for me? That means I know God's faithful. He doesn't give up on me. And I can always, always turn to him because he's always good to me. He's a good father. His nature does not change. It is always steady. He's the same as he was yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Right? We believe that. He says it. I believe it. James goes on in verse 18, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits in his, uh, or of his creatures. And so what James here is describing is the greatest gift that we receive of all, right? He says all good gifts and perfect gifts come from above. Well, what is the best gift of all? We know Jesus Christ, which is our salvation, right? We have given this wonderful gift of salvation. And so he kind of uses the same word here when it says brought forth, like the one we saw in verse 15, where he says to, to give birth, that's what Jesus does, right? He doesn't, he doesn't bring evil or wickedness, but he, gives, he brings goodness. He brings life, right? Sin gives birth to death, where Jesus gives birth or God gives birth to life, right? And to his children through the gift of salvation. In Romans, I'm going to read this to you. Bear with me. It's long. But Romans chapter 6 in verses 5 through 12. This is so important because Romans is rich in theology and doctrine, and it gives us real clear insight as to why God is good and what he has done for us. The, the, the clear distinction between the first Adam and the second Adam. What man has done and now what God has done. So he says, Paul, in verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in its lusts. And so we're going to see in chapter 5, too, is that the whole theme is that Jesus came to bring life, right? It's in, it, in his nature that he is the life source. I mean, think about the very first time that man sinned. What did God say if they ate of the fruit of the tree? What was the consequence? He says, you shall surely die. Did they die immediately? No, no but they ended up dying. It was never the intention for them to die, but they died. Why did they die? Because they were sinners. That's what sin produces, is death. How do I know that all men are sinners? Because all die. But Jesus came to give life. And it's common sense, or maybe not common sense, but it's pretty clear that if you reject the source of life, who is God, that you would be separated from him, and the consequence of that is death. It's not like God just came up with a rule all of a sudden, like, oh my gosh, they sinned, what do I do now? 
Uh, go sit in timeout. No, that's not good enough. Uh, you're going to die. No, it, it, it was just his very nature. That was the natural consequence. It's like if you jump off a building, well, what's, what's nature going to do? You're going to fall down, right? I mean, you, you, there's nothing else. And so because in his goodness and because he is the source of life, he is life, when they disobeyed and rejected him, well, they received death. But Jesus came to fix it. And so in Romans 5:12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Right? So we see here, because of that very first sin, now we all are subject to sin and death. But Paul goes on in verse 15, he says, The free gift is not like the offense. It's different. It's better. He says, If by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many and the gift is not like that which came through the one man who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. I mean, it took one man's sin to, to cause all to be sinners. Right? That's what Adam did. But for Jesus, the opposite is he took all sins so that we could be justified, so that we could be redeemed. He says in verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. And as we are made righteous, we see that we are transformed, that we are no longer our past identities, right? We have become new creatures, like, like James says here, right? But how do we become that new creation? How do we become those new creatures? How do we become the first fruits? Well, it happens by the word of truth is what James says. That's how it's produced. And so in verse 19, what we're going to see is the application of this. If the word of truth is so powerful in transforming us and accomplishing good, well, then we should make it a priority in our lives, right? So James goes on to say in verse 19, which I think, you know, oftentimes we use, we use it in premarital discipleship, you know, when, when kids want to get married or older people. Um, we say, hey, like, this is really good for communication, and it's good. Like, if you have a relationship and you want to grow in your communication, you should be <laughs> swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. But that's not the main point. James isn't throwing like a nugget for your marriage here in the middle of this rich text, right? It, it has to do with context. So the context is before the verse, this verse in verse 18, James is talking about the word of truth. He's talking about the word of God. He's talking about scripture. In the next verses, he's talking about scripture. He's talking about the word of God. So this relates here to the word of God. He says in verse 19, so then, which really means like, look, I'm about to appeal, the appeal that I am going to make here is banked upon what I just revealed to you, right? And he calls them my beloved brethren, basically saying, look, this appeal I'm making, I'm doing it in love. If God has given us new life through his word, then we have to prepare to receive it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, you know this, but it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right? We need the word of God. And what do we need to do when, we, when, when it's presented to us or when we read it, when we hear it? Well, James says, be swift to hear. It's not about speed. This isn't what I'm talking about. When he talks about swift and slowness, it's not speed. But swiftness here means an eagerness. Do I desire the word of God? Can, can, I, can I say what the psalmist says in, one, in Psalm 119 and also in Psalm 19 where he says, I opened my mouth wide and panted for I longed for your commandments? Or where he says, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb? I mean, the psalmist had a delight in God's word because it, it brought so much goodness. It grew him. And Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. Well, why? So you can grow. And many of us aren't growing because we're stuck, not, we're not persevering through these trials. We're not trusting in the word. We're not hiding in our hearts, we're not desiring it, but we're just going through the same old motions. So the question is, do we long for it? Do we delight in it? So we should be swift to hear, but also we should be slow to speak. And this isn't James saying, don't ever talk to God, right? We know that not to be true, but really what James is, is challenging the believer and challenging us is, is that 
there's those who are never silent before God. Right? When, when God confronts us, when God speaks to us, he rebukes us, he challenges us, whatever he's going to do, oftentimes we are quick to argue, we make excuses, or what do we do? We blame. Right? We blame, and we never own up. But we got to be like what Eli teaches Samuel when God speaks to Samuel. And Eli tells him what? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Because you cannot hear God if you're the only one doing the talking. So he says, be slow to speak. And then he follows that up with slow to wrath. Right? As you, th- as you read through the word of God, you realize that it, it really steps on your toes. It says some, some things that challenges you and reveals you know, some, some gross things about us. And what's my response to that? You know, oftentimes we get upset, we get angry. So when, it, when I'm confronted with it, do I in pride buck up and, and dismiss it? Or do I humble myself and allow God to, to continue to re- reveal that and change that and forgive that? Because ultimately what he says in verse 20 gives us the reason why we should be slow to anger because the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If we want to grow in righteousness, we have to stop arguing with God's word and submit to it. And then James goes on. I'm coming in for a close, I promise. Therefore, lay aside of all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. But he says, receive with meekness the implanted word. What does meekness mean? It has the idea of strength and and submission. It's, It's the opposite of that is pride. And how many times, or how many of us, I would say, would claim that the Bible has ultimate authority? I think all of us would pretty much say that. I think it'd be pretty unanimous. But do we surrender to it fully? And do we surrender to it in every aspect of our lives? Right? We can say it, but do we do it? Are we, are we teachable? Do we not only receive it, but do we also obey it? And I think that's what James is really saying here in the next verse where he says, don't just be doers of the word, uh, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So we blame all the deception on Satan, but sometimes we can deceive ourselves. Like Jesus said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you're mistaken. Well, Why? Because we've just been hearers and not doers only. We haven't allowed, it, allowed the word of God to, to speak to us. We talk too much. But then when we hear it, we don't obey it. We don't submit to it. And Jesus has a warning. And I'll end with this. He has a warning to those who only hear and don't obey. He says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. He says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. What happened? He was left standing. He persevered. Because he heard the word of God, and he obeyed the word of God. But he says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And that's where we don't receive the crown of life because we were just hearers and not doers. But I really believe that if God has transformed us, if we've experienced the grace of God, that we're not just going to be hearers, but we're going to be doers. And we're going to be found faithful. We're going to endure. We're going to persevere. That no matter what, God, what test God throws at us, he's going to provide some way and some opportunity to get through it, to persevere, and to give us the strength and the encouragement that we've, we've been found faithful And even the things that Satan throws at us, we're we're capable. Again, John says, I write these things to to you so that you may not sin. Like, we don't have to sin. It's interesting, right? But again, we know, and I'm so thankful that God is gracious in knowing that we, we do sin, right? And again, perseverance is not perfection, but it's a matter of hearing the word of God, and when it calls us out, when it reveals to us, and it convicts us, and the Holy Spirit convicts us of, hey, this is wrong, this is bad, Well, then we repent, we confess. God is faithful to forgive us. And what he does is he picks us back up. And in the end, I'll be found standing. And that's what I want to do, is that having done all to be found standing. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. I pray that you continue to speak to us and encourage us. Lord, I'm so thankful that you don't give up on us. Lord, that you're unchanging, you never waver. Lord, you are always good. Lord, I thank you that you realize that we do fall, that we do battle against the flesh, 
Lord, and sometimes we, we fail. And I'm so thankful that you are a God who is long-suffering, a God who is gracious, a God who is loving. And Lord, that you forgive us, that you cleanse our feet, Lord, when we stumble. And Lord, I pray that all of us here would be found standing in the end. Lord, that we would persevere, that we would not give up. No matter what anyone is going through in this moment, I pray that you would just continue to reveal your goodness. Lord, continue to reveal that you are light, a light that never wavers, never changes. And so we just thank you. We pray that you go before us this week as we continue to, to think upon these things, that you challenge us in these things. And we just pray that you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.